Welcome to Zero Knowledge. I'm your host, Anna Rose. In this podcast, we will be exploring the latest in zero knowledge research and the decentralized web, as well as new paradigms that promise to change the way we interact and transact online. This week, Tarun and I chat with Ye Cheng and Hai Chen Chen from Scroll. We discuss the founding of the Scroll project, the problems they aim to solve with their native ZK EVM layer 2 solution, why scaling Ethereum is important, the philosophy of their ZK EVM and how this differs from other proposals, as well as potential use cases or products that could benefit from the system. We wrap up with an exploration of how dApps and products on top of such a ZK EVM may interact with the main chain and with other applications. But before we start in, I want to let you know that the ZK Podcast crew is growing. We are currently taking on a number of new projects, and we're looking to hire an additional content producer to join us. There's a job posting for this content producer over on the ZK Jobs Board. Just a reminder, the ZK Jobs Board is a spot where you can find jobs from all sorts of top ZK teams, not only the podcast. So you might want to check that out either way. For this role of content producer... The job requires you to have at least two years of experience working on regular content production. Ideally, you would be organized, good at project management, and somewhat familiar with the field. There's no need to be an expert on ZK, but some familiarity with our community would be ideal. If you or someone you know fits the bill, please apply. You can find the links in the description, and I hope to hear from you. Now, I want to invite Tanya to share a little bit about this week's sponsor. Today's episode is sponsored by Anoma. Anoma is a set of protocols that enable self-sovereign coordination. Their unique architecture facilitates efficiently the simplest forms of economic coordination, such as two parties transferring an asset to each other, as well as more sophisticated ones like an asset-agnostic bartering system involving multiple parties without direct coincidence of wants, or even more complex ones such as N-Party, collective commitments to solve multipolar traps, where any interaction can be performed with adjustable zero-knowledge privacy. Anoma's first fractal instance, Namada, is planned for later in 2022, and it focuses on enabling shielded transfers for any assets, with a few second transaction latency and near zero fees. Visit anoma.net for more information. That's anoma.net. So thanks again, Anoma. Now here is Anna and Tarun's interview with Scroll. So this week, Tarun and I are here with two members of the founding team of Scroll. Welcome, Ye Chang, and hi, Chen Chen. Hi, Anna. Uh, Thanks for having us. Hi, Anna and Tarun. Glad to be here. Great. Definitely excited to have you guys on. Just a quick disclosure, uh, both Tarun and I were both investors in Scroll kind of early. We invested a while back. Myself through the ZK Validator and Tarun through Robot Ventures. But I know that there's like you know, a lot has changed since we did those early meetings, and it would be really great for us to learn a little bit about what's happened since. Let's start off with a little bit of an intro to each of you and to find out how you arrived on this problem or what you were working on. So my name is Ye. I'm the co-founder of Scroll. More specifically, I work on ZK Research. So I work on hardware acceleration for the unknown proof and uh, protocol design behind the ZK algorithm. So before starting Scroll, my background is more in academic. Uh, I started to work on Zona Proof four years ago, back in 2018, where the biggest bottleneck of using Zona Proof in practice is a large proving overhead. And I was doing uh, research in the area of computer architecture and uh, combining with my hardware knowledge, I started my first research on hardware acceleration for Zona Proof. So the idea is just using FPGA ASIC to make proving faster. And uh, having more hands-on experience from the hardware project, I got a much better of CK. I was very lucky to work with Professor Andrew Miller at UIUC and dive deeper into the theoretical side of ZK. Uh, it was exactly during that time, the second half of 2019, there were a bunch of new ZK protocols coming out, including Sonic, Planck, Marlin, and Halo based on the polynomial commitment. And I was following the literature very, very closely. I become really addicted to those polynomials. It's much more interesting than, than just hardware. And uh, so the mass construction behind the ZK protocol is just very beautiful and elegant. So besides the hardware and theoretical research, I have also done some 
application level stuff with my advisor Mike and other collaborators at NYU. So that's my my experience uh, before starting Scroll. So the, the chance to start Scroll dates back to 2020 when there is an explosion in DeFi and uh, I met Sandy and Hai Chen, the two other co-founders through some mutual friends in the field of competitive math and also ETH community. We, mm-hmm. we find that Ethereum needs a scaling solution, but all the existing ZK rollups have the problem of being too application specific and also like they, they generate proof in a centralized way, which is very hard to scale. So we want to solve this problem and build a new, totally new layer two with a more general EVM support and uh, a decentralized prover. So it's also exciting to see some of the research uh, outcome come into practice. Yeah, so that's basically the, the high, high level overview of how school started. And Cool. Hi, Chen, what about you? Where did, where did you start? So previously, I, I didn't like working the Web3. So I previously like working in Web2 for a few years. I worked in the Amazon the AWS for a few years. And then we we're focusing on working in the some AI compiler to optimize the model development. Uh, so actually like uh, about like a one and a half year or like the two years ago, like I met with Ye, like as you mentioned. Uh, so some common friends. And at that time like he was finishing up the his hardware accelerator papers. And, and then that's like where he got me intro into this zero knowledge proof. Uh, and then teach me a lot about, about like the mass and then the protocol behind that. Uh, at that time, like, I was very fascinated by the zero knowledge proof. I think like the it's very magic, like the which you can just do like a very small computation to verify some uh, very large computation. So I think I I previously like uh, know a little bit about that, but I didn't know the details. Like uh, after like learning like more details, like getting more and more attracted with that. Uh, and then we were kind of discussing like what we can do using this zero knowledge proof. And then the, it turns out like the ZK rollup and then building the ZK EVM is kind of one of the way we should like use that and that powerful tool in the, in the mass. Mm. And then before that, like, before like I joining the Amazon, like I was uh, getting my PhD at the University of Washington. Uh, but like my background is more in the system optimization, like building distributed system and then building the compiler optimization stuff. And then, yeah, that's like the how I got started. Nice. It sounds like your background was very well suited to later do this. When you were doing distributed system stuff, though, were you touching blockchain or was it like general distributed systems? It's more general distributed systems, like building uh, some distributed serving system for the uh, for the machine learning workload. But at that time, like uh, doing the PhD, uh, we also kind of did some explore uh, some of the uh, blockchains and then the crypto stuff. Uh, at that time, like uh, we were mostly looking at the Bitcoin and thinking how we can extend the Bitcoin like a little bit. Uh, and then we were even working on some like the prototypes, trying to see like uh, we can build some more object oriented language for like uh, new blockchains. But I guess that turns out like uh, we didn't like the work that f- at full time during the PhD time. Got it. Let's go back to the beginning then of Scroll, the company. So there's three co-founders, I guess. Yes. Okay. And so you'd all met and you decided to take on a project. You wanted to work with zero knowledge proofs. What part of the ecosystem were you in when you decided to sort of start working on a ZK EVM? Yeah, I think we are mostly part of the Ethereum community. Uh, for example, like my background is more in the ZK stuff, but you know, I, I have read a lot of research from, from Ethereum community and I know like it's a very creative community. You know, we are pretty value aligned with the ECM community. This open source and uh, decentralized, and we are pretty value with, with this. And also, like, you know, our mutual friend are also in the ETH community and thinking Ethereum is the best settlement layer and uh, especially it's need scaling. So that's the reason why we, we, we choose to build on top of that. Yeah. Were you connected to the EF? Like, did you work closely with them? And the reason I'm asking this is, and we're going to get to this a little bit, while, like a little while later, but like there were designs and ideas around ZK EVM coming out of there. So that's why I'm curious if that's where like some of your original thoughts on it come from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a good question. So it's, it's very interesting. Like, you know, it's also uh, a nice coincidence. Like I was chatting with Barry Whitehead from ECM Foundation and uh, seeking help for the first review of the our scrolls first version. And uh, it happens that he is also looking into the general purpose ZK event problem. And, oh, uh, wow. Because, you know, yeah. And so the collaboration between us and uh, the the PSE team, the, the used to be called Apply ZKP team in ECM Foundation, happens very organically because they want to build this and we want to build this, like, you know, 
at that time, like, you know, everything we have is just scratch and we are pretty value aligned. And we also do believe that developing in the open source way owned by the community is the best way to, to really make it. And we are very excited to co-build this solution together to literally scale Ethereum. And uh, we, are, we are also proud that uh, in this community, nearly half of the contributors are from our team and we have been co-building this effort for around one year now. Wow. This is super interesting, though, that you are actually tackling the problem separately. Met Barry, turns out they were trying to tackle the same problem. What inspired the problem in the first place? Like, maybe here we can start to break down what even ZK EVM means. Like, why ZK EVM? I think, you know, it's, it's, it's twofold. Like, one is that why we are, have to build towards this EVM equivalence approach. Um, because, you know, there are some other teams building some ZK VM and uh, some other solutions. So firstly, I, like from us, EVM equivalence really matters because it's secure because you can inherit the security property from EVM model, which we all defined years ago and has been test of time. And we have exactly the same behavior as EVM to be very secure. And secondly, that EVM has a very strong network effect. It has the largest developer community and also numerous steps built on that. And also there are a lot of infrastructures and toolings around. We can support all of them seamlessly without any delegate labor. And also like Ethereum has a very active research community. As I mentioned previously, they are proposing a lot of innovations around like many EIPs to improve Ethereum. And if you build you know, something which is EVM equivalent, you can adopt those innovations ahead of time because you have the same environment. And also like, you know, comparing against you know, there are some other solutions to, to go into the way of ZKVM. But I think in our case, in terms of layer two, ZKVM is the best way to really scale Ethereum. Because uh, from our side, the highest priority is not looking for a new virtual machine to support more complicated computation. But instead, the urgency is migrating existing dApps from layer one to layer two. So we think the best way to do that is provide the same environment with uh, with a seamless migration experience. And uh, I know there are also some complaints about EVM versus other virtual machine, but we, we believe that EVM is still the best practice for smart contract execution because it has been years of exploration. And I think Vitalik also has some article talking about the design trade-off behind EVM and why they, they would still choose the EVM path, like even if they know there are a lot of other virtual machines. And uh, we, we do believe that some you know, some other ZKVM can be used for in some applications. And uh, we have a research team actively looking into this direction as our next step. But we are thinking about how to add more advanced features uh, in ZKVM as an extension to our ZKVM. Also, another technical difference is that building a ZKVM is much harder than ZKVM. And, but we decided to take that using more advanced crypto and hardware optimization and uh, to, to provide the best developer experience. I think maybe one thing that would be worth talking through is comparison of the different EVM equivalence methods and like sort of what it means to be like a fully equivalent ZK EVM. I think there's like obviously a lot of confusion around what qualifies as being fully EVM compatible versus like strictly Solidity bytecode compatible versus sort of like the proof generation process is separate from the execution trace directly, stuff like that. So like maybe let's like walk through what scroll means by EVM equivalence and then how that compares to say some of the other protocols that, that are talking about EVM equivalence, like say Matter Labs or, or other places. Yeah, because I do think it, it can be quite confusing when you first hear ZK EVM, because a lot of people kind of were like, oh, like someone else already said they were doing that, but then it turns out to like have some limitations. So technically speaking, ZK EVM is simulating the behavior of EVM in circuits. And uh, so in our definition and also the ZK EVM we are building with the open source community, we are targeting at bytecode level compatibility, which means the ZK EVM should follow the definition of the, the Ethereum virtual machine yellow paper. They, they define some opcodes. There are a lot of definitions in, in, in that one. And we, sh we think, you know, if you are really building a ZK EVM using the term EVM, you should follow their standard. And it can provide exactly the same environment as the, the, the current EVM on Ethereum. And uh, as for some comparison, I think 
uh, in terms of the, the technology stack and also the compatibility side, we are pretty close to, to Polygon Hermit. They are an incredible team led by Jordi and building something also fantastic. Both of us are targeting at bytecode level compatibility and have a very similar architecture. But there are some technical differences from the implementation side. So we are more close to the native Ethereum implementation. Uh, for example, we are we are directly using a fork of native gas to produce our layer two block. A uh, gas is short for Go Ethereum. It's it's the most robust and uh, well known Ethereum node implementation and has been used across a lot of places. We also design some sub circuits to prove for each opcode in gas execution trees. And it's easier to verify that the circuit, the circuit has exactly the same behavior as native Ethereum. Uh, but for Polygon Hermes, I think they are rewriting each EVM opcode using a new assembly language and a general proof for their underlying state machine. I think it's more from an implementation side instead of because both of us are targeting at bytecode level compatibility. I think their approach might need more work to build everything from scratch. As for the, the, the comparison between Starkware and uh, ZK Sync, it's more different because I, as I mentioned previously, we are targeting at EVM equivalence and uh, to achieve bytecode level compatible. But for them, they are building their own virtual machine, which is different from Ethereum virtual machine, and also building a compiler to compile solidity to this underlying VM. So their VM has a totally new set of opcodes, and also like they need to build on top of a compiler and to, to achieve language compatible. So I think that's the biggest difference. There is actually, like last year I did an episode with uh, Poly well, Hermes at the time, now Polygon Hermes, where we did do kind of a look deep into ZK EVM and the way that they were building it. I remember that they did highlight that each opcode would be equivalent. How is it working for you if it isn't? Like you're not rewriting each opcode. So how do you make it actually work without having to compile? I think for their approach, for each opcode, they will have some like, a relatively small like state machine or some rewrite unit and assembly code. So what we do is that for each opcode, we will directly build some customized circuit for this opcode. So it's one-to-one -one mapping. Like for add, we directly build some circuits for add. And in, instead of you know running add as a state machine. And so that's that's some technical implementation difference. But I think both us can achieve all the opcodes level compatible. So the way like we're building the ZK EVM is that we can take each opcode and then write a gadget, like a, a small component which inside the ZK uh, circuit that you, you write a gadget for each opcode and then simulate the behavior uh, like according to the implementation, the actual implementation or the, from the specs. So you can uh, say like the, so an add opcode for example in the uh, EVM, you need to pop two values from the stack and then do the addition uh, within the 256 bit range, and then you do uh, push back the results to that. So in the circuit, you need to do the exact same things. You need to uh, verify that the two options to the add opcode is actually popped from the stack. And then you like the, write a constraint to say like the results is actually the addition uh, of these two operands, and then you push back that value back to the stack. One thing that's important to, to also remember is that like the the proof of actually the execution trace versus sort of like something that does a transpile step and you really are proving execution of the transpile thing, not the actual EVM can be quite different or like have a bigger attack surface in some ways. Why attack surface? Well, they're more moving parts, right? So like, let's say I have a high, another language, right? That's compiling to EVM bytecode but I only prove what happens in the other language's execution environment before it gets converted. There's this problem of like, well, is my translation perfect? Mm. And it's not necessarily that there doesn't exist a perfect translation, right? These things are still kind of bounded Turing machines and whatever, but it's more that implementing one that like catches every single edge case is actually extremely difficult. You know, an example of this is that you know, in the early days of uh, iPhones and sort of Android phones, there was this huge movement to like have people make these transpilers that were like, you could just write an app in Android and compile it to iOS and vice versa. And like, they had way more security problems than the native code in general. And so there is sort of that from from a security standpoint, I, I do think like it is also worth keeping in mind the fewer moving parts the more you can like be confident in the code that's written. 
Yeah, exactly. I think the, the one importance of the ZK EVM is that it doesn't require any additional infrastructure to make your smart code, like the smart contract code, to be compatible with the ECM. And then also you make sure that it, uh, your smart contract is executed exactly on the, the EVM compatible, like equivalent uh, environment so that you can make sure all of the code so should be behave as like what you expected from the specs of the ECM. In that case, though, why wouldn't everyone do like an EVM with EVM opcodes? Like, what are the trade offs that you have to face? Like, is it harder to build? Is it longer to process? Like, yeah, I'm just curious. Like, why why doesn't everyone do that? Is there is there a, sh- a faster path if you don't? Uh, I think you know, as mentioned, like the EVM is much harder to build because you know EVM is a stack based virtual machine. But for for the owner proof, it can naturally support a register based virtual machine. So it's you know just for this step, it will already add a lot of overhead. And also like for EVM, there is there are a lot of ZK unfriendly opcodes like SHA three, and also inefficient data structures. For example, like EVM word size is is not on prime field; it's on like two hundred and fifty six bits. So you need ring check everywhere, which just explode your your circuit as a very huge overhead to the to ZK. And especially for, for this data storage, you need Merkle potential tree, which is another huge overhead. But for ZK VM, you get more flexibility because you can have your own defined instruction set and uh, you, you can build that to be more ZK friendly and have a much smaller proving overhead. The ZK VM was thought to be like impossible in the past. Uh, I think it's just with recent breakthroughs like advanced circuit optimization, hardware acceleration, and some recursive proof, we can massively improve the performance of prover and finally make that feasible. Because, you know, it's even if it has a very large overhead, like, you know, people still like it because it's still very developer friendly. But, you know, there are some technical challenges in the past. Yeah, actually, maybe could we walk through, I don't know, a year or two ago when people thought a ZKVM was not possible? What's sort of the chronology and timeline of the events that changed people's minds? Uh, I think, you know, first is from the circuit emulation part, because first in the past, we, we just had R1C as our circuit emulation, and which, you know, it, it's hard to build something which is more customized. And also, especially for EVM, like, you know, you have 256 bit, it needs very specialized gadgets to prove for, you know, range. And I think with some breakthrough, like uh, Aztec proposed P-Lookup, which is a nice way to prove for some ZK unfriendly uh, primitives, you just need to prove that something is within a, a table and this belonging relationship, and that's it. So I think that's very important primitive to deal with those, you know, ZK unfriendly opcodes at the circuit animation part. And also like another important thing, like you can also use this lookup to, to link different components. For example, like in a state circuit, you prove that your read and write are correct over the same elements. And in another circuit, you prove that your execution is correct. And then you need to prove that, you know, the elements in, in different circuits are the same. So you need lookup to, to prove that this belonging relationship and the P lookup can provide a very efficient way to do this. And I think both us and uh, like Polygon Hermit, even some team building the KVM are using the same approach to, to link, you know, the execution and also the storage. I think that's the, the biggest like improvement. And uh, on the backend side, I think there is hardware acceleration. It's just drawing more and more people's attention. It just happens simultaneously. We, we find, you know, not only from the front end circuit and system, this inside, like, you know, your proving is still very large. And the hardware, because, you know, even if your proving is, takes very long time, it's highly parallelable because it only contains some group operation or ability curve and also FFTs. So both two parts are, are highly parallelable. And we have done a lot of previous research around GPU acceleration and also ASIC acceleration. So we exactly know, like, you know, using such kind of technology, you can improve the performance for maybe two order of magnitude to really make that feasible. So I think it just happens. And uh, like before that, people don't know, like, you know, this can be leveraged here because I think, you know, in the owner proof, it's very hard for you to outsource this proving to a third party because, you know, the case mostly in the past used to be some privacy preserving application. So you can't, you know, give your secret key and your secret information to a hardware provider. But, you know, in ZK Rob, there is no ZK. There is just validity proof needed. So you can easily outsource this proof generation to a hardware provider. They can run GPU cluster, 
IPJ data center or like even produce ASIC. So I think that's a huge opportunity for this pool to, to cut in and solve the efficiency problem. And finally, the recursive proof is that I think also like using the sum of the optimization, you can generate proof for proofs efficiently. And especially for some non-native field oper operation, you can aggregate that. I think that's also important to reduce the overall like verification costs because the EVM circuit is composed of many sub-circuits and for each sub-circuit, you will result in proof. If you verify all the proof on chain, it will be a very large overhead and you need to aggregate them to make your final proof smaller. I think that's also important, but that's, that's, that's also like, you know, built on top of, you know, the optimization. So I think that's the biggest thing, like, you know, in, in making this possible. So you just mentioned like that it's circuits upon, and then there's sub circuits. Would you say is is this still in the realm of a snark that you're using at, at this core, or is this some like modified semi Stark like snark? I mean, I know when I was talking to Jordy from Hermes, like there was also like Stark like techniques used with snarks. So you didn't really know what the word for this thing was anymore. It's yeah, a yeah, Franken yeah, that... Franken snark Stark or something yeah 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 that's a that's a very <laughs> good question so like you know because yeah I, I think you know both snark and stark have just some some zk protocol and if you are describing a zk protocol a better way is just to describe what kind of circuit optimization you are using and what the polynomial commitment you are using because you can have different combinations for those for those parts for stark is usually like air at or air as their circuit optimization and use fry as their polynomial commitment. And uh, but for for us, we are using like you know both sides. We are on the circuit optimization side. We are using Plunkish optimization implemented in Halo Two by the Zcash team. And uh, in the in the backend polynomial commitment. So the initial version in Halo Two they use some bulletproof styled inner product argument, but we replace that with with KDG because you know although like. The, the previous one implementing Halo 2 had many nice properties, but we replaced that because we want to verify our proof on Ethereum and the pasta curve is not supported directly on Ethereum. So that's the reason why we choose to, to change that to KZG to make our proof more, more efficiently verified on Ethereum. So basically it's Plunkish optimization plus KZG as polynomial commitment. And for both the EVM circuits and the aggregation circuit, we are, we are not using any star related technology. You said Plonky or Plonky too? Uh, it's Plonkish optimization. It's a, it's a new name proposed by. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, is this a different one? This is Plonkish. Yeah. No. Yeah. Yes, Plonkish. It's um. I think <laughs> oh it's a God. word like proposed by 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 Dara. Like on Twitter, like there are some votes like to describe oh. what kind of optimization you can use. It's called. Plonkish oh, it's a kind of arithmetic. Okay. 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 Yes. But yes. it's not Plonk specifically, or is Plonk at the heart of what you're doing as well? So basically, the literature look like this. So basically, there is Plonk. Mm -hmm. which only support the addition and the multiplication gate. And then okay. like there is plookup, which is a separate primitive to prove the, this lookup relationship. But yes. how do you combine this plookup with the plunk? And the, the Aztec people propose some semantics called turbo plunk to combine two different primitives in one in one way. And then like I think Zcash team use a more flexible way to represent this, you know, different relationships called ultra plunk and then like they renamed this ultra, ultra plunk, plunk to, yes. to plunkish optimization so yeah that's how this name oh my gosh i have i actually want to do a whole session at some point which just maps all the derivations of the word plunk and what they mean and how they work together but plunkish okay that that was one part but then you also said halo and i wanted to just double check if you were saying techniques from halo or halo 2 yeah we are using halo 2 okay Except that you're using KCG instead of the pasta curve that they're using? Yes, yes. Okay. And is there any other variations on this? Like, is there any other additions or changes that you've incorporated into your model? Yeah, I think that's mostly about the, the ideas, both in ZK EVM. So in ZK EVM, we, we have multiple sub-circuits and the lookup relationships. And in aggregation circuit, we, we, we handle some non-native field operations and uh, generate proof for that. I think for the Halo 2, we also extended the API a little bit. So to be making more flexible uh, use case in the, uh, in the ZK EVM. During our building, we found like there's some limitation from the API. And then so we modify a little bit. And also we, since we also changed their curve, so we also changed the recursive scheme in, in, in our version of the Halo 2. 
But we also plan to actually discuss with the Zcash team to see how to upstream all of the features. And then I think they're also interested in our way of the hacking the Halo 2 to adding uh, those kind of the new changes. Cool. Isn't there a sort of another camp of thought? Like, I'm kind of just curious, like, what made you choose to work on this particular direction? Yeah, I, th- I think when we are started, like, we, we, we have this discussion with, with, with Barry and also the Ethereum Foundation's team. And I think because we, we definitely need the customer gate support and also the lookup argument support. And, and uh, uh, at that time, like, Halo 2 is the only implementation that supports both two primitives in the open source way and with a nice license. And also, like, you know, the, the, the libraries built by the cache team also had usually had a very high security guarantee. Nice. So, yeah. What do you actually use to build this stuff? Like, what languages are you using? So we are, we are using Rust because Halo 2 is written in Rust. Okay. So we need to follow their yeah, APIs to write circuits. And I mean, there's a lot of teams, a lot of ZK teams, which are, which are introducing like native DSLs. Since you are working with EVM, I'm, I'm assuming the language to build on your ZK EVM will be Solidity. But do you also need anyone to interact with the underlying ZK circuits in a special way that like maybe Solidity can't? Uh, I think for now, like we, we will only expose some very high level EVM API to, to the developers. They don't need to touch any low level details. But in the future, if you want to add more advanced features, like, you know, support something which EVM can't support in our ZK EVM, we might need to hack that a bit and they can add some sub circuits to our current system and to interact with some, you know, solidity contract. And uh, that's one potential direction, but that's not what we are building for now. What we are building is just the same environment for you to migrate. Yeah. Is there a delay? Like if you wanted to move from the L2 to the L1 with a ZK EVM, is it slower or faster or is there any sort of like change versus something like optimistic rollup or like the more non ZK EVM ZK rollups? Like I'm just trying to picture if these steps of like creating, you know, the snark in that particular way, if, if there's any sort of time lag on that. So in general, ZK rollup has a roughly similar like delay for withdrawal transaction only. So for, for those transaction happening within layer two, you get some instant confirmation because you have some centralized sequencer. And as far as your transaction included, you can confirm. But for the joining from layer layer two to layer one, the up usually takes maybe one hour or minutes, depending on your TPS. If your TPS is higher, like more transactions, you can just upload your proof faster because, you know, one proof can be amortized over a lot of transactions. So it it also depends on how many transactions you have in your in your system. For ZK EVM, because your, your proving all had a larger but uh, another interesting design in our current system is that we have a decentralized prover system, which means for we will generate multiple blocks in parallel. And for each block, there will be some prover to take this block and generate proof. So th- all those blocks can be generated proof in parallel. And, uh, you know, we, we still get a high throughput amortized and uh, proving time is not a big issue on our platform. So the delay will be similar to other ZK rollups. But comparing with optimistic rollup, they take around like seven days to get the finality of withdrawal transaction. They are based on some game theory and uh, like economic assumptions. So they basically need an honest node to re-execute the transactions and, and challenge if he finds this wrong. So they need to make sure that at least one honest node capture this. So they need seven days for withdrawal from layer two to layer one. I want to kind of go a little deeper on this. You just mentioned the decentralized prover. I actually had a question here about like the agent that runs the operator of the ZK rollup. This is like, I always am trying to figure out what that is in every system. So often it'll be called like a sequencer in certain things like the Starkware setup. It's like they have a committee. Um, I'm just curious, like in your case, the decentralized prover, is that acting as the agent that bridges over to the main chain? Yeah, I think currently we have two roles. One is called sequencer and the other is called roller. So sequencer is for, you know, collecting transactions, receiving transactions from a user and a generator layer to block. And then like, you know, after you generate this block, roller like in our system is acting as a prover. So it's actually generating a proof and the sequencer will send this block or some witness or execution trace to roller. And this roller will generate proof and send back the proof 
because、mm. currently the sequencer is centralized, but the pooler is decentralized because we can leverage the the computation power from the network. And then the sequencer verify the proof or maybe get aggregate the proof and submit the proof on chain. So、I、it's、see. you know still a centralized sequencer to generate block, and but you know it's decentralized pooler to generate proof for for computation power. Yeah. Quick question.、Mm-hmm. Um, Does the sequencer have to provide some data availability proof also, or just strictly a proof of, of execution? Yeah, actually, so the sequencer will provide the data availability. So I think you can mimic this like、uh, in a way of the proposer and the builder. So which the sequencer now is the proposer, it generates the blocks,、uh, and then also like it sequences the transactions and generates the block, and then provide the data availability to the layer one chains, and then. It will send like the, the some like the transaction data or like the trace to the roller, which roller kind of generating the validity proof and upload it to the layer one, so to to seal all of the transaction within that batch. Right. Okay. Wait. So the roller actually publishes the proof directly. The sequencer only kind of gives them the transactions, both the data that's sampled as well as the execution call sites, but the roller posts the proof on chain themselves. Or am I getting the flow wrong of that? Yeah, yeah, I think like that's the basic idea. So actually, there will be some discussion like this.、Uh, in that way, like the the sequencer、uh, roll up the、uh, just send the data availability roller sends out the validity proof, makes the system like the very easier to be decentralized like in both、uh, positions like in both rows. I think that's like very natural way to do that. Right. So actually, one question is if I'm a, a user of the roll up. Do I send my transactions to both the sequencer and the roller, or do I send it to only the sequencer? Only to the sequencer. Only the sequencer. Okay. Cool. That makes sense. Do you think you will decentralize the sequencer, or not?、Uh, yes, yeah, we will.、Yeah. We will decentralize the sequencer. So it makes like the whole layer two becomes the trustless. So you don't need to trust any centralized entity, and also will be more censorship resistant. On the rollup side, on the L two, is there also any sort of like validator of the actual underlying data, or is that the prover? Is the prover sort of acting like that? Yeah, I think you can think of like the, the prover is acting like a validator, but you don't need to have every of the roller, or we just call it rollers,、uh, yeah, yeah. to be、uh, verify all of them to participate into validate a block. You just only have like a few, like as a small committee to verify that, and then someone can roll up the validity proof to them. Quick question on the point of decentralizing the sequencer: Is the long term idea to basically have like a pool of Machines that are, can be both rollers and sequencers, like people can sort of like stake in some way, and then they get randomly selected to one of the two batches, such that like you know, yes, there's a single sequencer for one slot, but you're you have some rotation. Or do you do you view that as like too complicated? I'm just kind of curious, like what what are sort of the different ways you're thinking of decentralizing the sequencer? Um, I think you cannot、uh, have like the people randomly selected for the sequencer or become a prover or roller.、Uh, so this is because the it has different hardware requirement for different positions. Like the sequencer, you just need to generate the block fast enough and to keep up the throughput. But for the roller, sometimes you may need some accelerators like GPU, FPGA, or like ASIC、uh, to be really able to generate the proof fast enough for that. So the, actually, there's different requirements for、uh, different roles. So kind of like if you just only you can stake for become a sequencer, stake for become a roller. Yeah, I guess、mm. the reason I'm asking is more from the perspective of like, it is likely that to some extent you're going to have quite a huge overlap in the actual entities that are running both of these, right? Like someone who's already running a roller is already in a data center, likely, and like could easily run a, a sequencer node as well. So I guess the main question is like. How does that sort of change how you think about the sort of like allocation to these different parties? And do you think it's like something where, you know, you're fine with the the election of a sequencer being sort of like not、uh, unknown? Because like you know, at this point, we don't really have like single secret leader election. Like there's sort of like some. You know, I mean, if you want to implement the FHE needed for it, then I think you can do it. But I think we're still a little far away from that. So, 
how much do you think that matters here? And sort of like, how are you thinking about this fact that like the set of sequencers and the set of rollers will probably have pretty high overlap, at least to start? Yeah, expect to be more rollers than the uh, sequencers because uh, in the sequencer, we don't really need to, we just need to have like a, a handful, like the, a few number of the sequencers to be censorship resistant. But for the rollers, you kind of like, you need to keep up all of the throughput. It depends on like how fast you can generate the proof and then what's the TPS you want to support. So as like Ye mentioned before, we have multiple blocks that can be generated in parallel. So that means like you need more rollers uh, to generate the proofs for those blocks. So uh, we expect like there'll be like a ratio we'll keep, we want to keep and then maintain. And then find like it's like the 10 to 1 or it depends on the proof generation cost. So that would be like keeping some ratio to have like the more rollers um, to generate the proof in parallel. How are you thinking about block size as a function of number of rollers that are registered? Like, do you view this as like a fixed block size type of thing or do you view it as elastic as a function of like the capacity of the number of rollers? Um, I think that it's still a fixed sized block. Uh, so it doesn't like the effect like the form of how many rollers you need to support. So usually like that the block size is limited by how many steps you can include in the circuit. So and, and also can translate that into some gas limit you have for the layer two block. Yeah, I, I can add maybe slightly more because we are using an EVM circuit. So the largest like you know block size you, you can support actually depends on like you know transaction. For example, like you got some very complicated maybe flash loan transaction, it needs to involve several contract loading and a lot of other opcodes. So this will make your 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 trace, your execution trace longer. So it basically depends on how complicated your transaction have and how many steps it need to be included in EVM. And that depends on the largest capacity of a block instead of just a number of transactions because different transactions differ a lot. Yeah, it depends on like how many steps you have for for this execution on EVM. Right. So the reason I was asking this is I was like reading the Starkware fee model, um, which like has sort of like a thing that, you know, it's not as aggressive as the IP1559, but it like does adjust sort of the block size to sort of the number of steps. And they, they have a notion of step, which I'm not sure if that notion is like, it's not as clean as, say, the EVM notion of a transaction, as far as I can tell. But I, I was just more curious, like, you know, in Ethereum mainnet, right, we do have variable size blocks now, right, in the sense of 1559 does sort of force that. So I'm kind of curious, like, does that impact how provers have to interact with these systems? Because I could imagine something where, you know, if, like, the block size goes up, then like some provers like stop proving because like their like relative economic share of the network went down. If the block size goes down, maybe it encourages more people. The economics of these these types of things, I think, is very, you know, as we are seeing with Starkware, because uh, they've had some interesting like fee market kind of things that have been happening in the last maybe like two weeks. I was just kind of curious, how where do you see this evolving? Do you see it like? being something where like the economics of these things are static or the economics are kind of like changing as a function of usage. You know, obviously it's it's far out right now, but mm -hmm. I think it will, it will be something that will kind of like impact how people think about writing code for that they run on scroll. Yeah, actually, I think that's a very interesting question. I, I think that we're also making like they're doing more research of like economic models, like how to separate these two roles and then how to keep like the both roles incentivized. Yeah, I think for sure, like the block size, I think will be dynamic. But mentioning that the circuit size actually is fixed, so you can have a prefixed uh, a circuit size, which you you know like how many of course how many steps you can fit into the circuit. Uh, so that's like the kind of that's the limiting factor for that. But in terms of economic models, I think we're doing like more research to see like how to keep incentivize like you can keep some of the base fee, like then you can separate like the base fee and the MEV values, for example, like that to use that to reward different positions, different roles. So, but I think a lot of things like uh, currently like, it's uh, still under some research. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, but that like by not being the first roll up, you can learn a lot from, mm -hmm. say, like what's happening on Starkware fee in the fee market. And uh, it will be yeah. kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. We're, we're also like the kind of learning a lot of things from the existing ones, and then see like the to avoid some of the mistakes to make, uh, and then trying to like the make things like the work more smoothly here in the scroll. 
I guess one other thing, you know, we've talked a little bit about how hardware acceleration was sort of like a key facet to getting ZKVM to work. And hardware can mean commodity hardware like FPGAs or GPUs. It could mean specialized hardware like ASICs. How do you view that landscape evolving over, say, the next one to two years? And do you think that like at launch, when Scroll launches, you'll have you know, FPGAs ready or GPUs ready or like which kind of provers do you think will be there on launch and then live when you're live? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So basically we are internally developing a very fast GPU solution because we are a software company. We have a lot of, like we, we, we hire some GPU uh, like programmers and also we started this research for GPU acceleration around like one year ago. So it's basically when we are online, we will definitely have our GPU prover already to support, to provide very strong computation power already to support very high TPS. So I think in terms of the, the comparison between GPU, ASIC, and PJ, I think GPU will be the first in go to market and the first being practical to be used. And then like FPGA can win GPU, not in terms of speed, but in terms of the energy consumption, like, you know, at the same speed up, like FPGA can be more energy efficient. And, but I think it needs a lot of dedicated work to make FPGA really better than GPU because we have previous experience on working with both FPJ, ASIC, and GPU. So we, we know like pretty clear that, you know, although like you can build some customized units using FPJ and ASIC, but GPU still, especially our version, we can be 10 times faster than the, than the best open source GPU implementation. So it's significantly faster and it's very hard to build a, build a new, new version, which can beat our current GPU version. But I know there are some efforts behind this building some IPG data center and they can be more like energy efficient. And I think it's also IPG is a very important milestone, like before you have ASIC. And because, you know, there are some specialized operations, for example, multi-scalar multiplication uh, over a curve, those primitives are highly parallel and uh, can be more suitable for ASIC. So I think, you know, Maybe within two or three years, we can have ASIC, which can beat both FPG and uh, GPU. And another concern behind this is that the zero knowledge proof algorithm involves like in one year, like you def- you find something which is more efficient. So I think it's just ASIC will chip in a later stage when the algorithm become more and more stable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's sort of always been the main question. So like having worked in building ASICs, like it takes you like two years to tape out. Like you're not going to like, you know, by the time you verified your design, like yeah, maybe like a new processor spec has come out. So I guess my question is, you know, in a space where uh, we can't even agree on the names of the precise architecture, we instead keep adding new suffixes to plonk every <laughs> two months or whatever. Um, you know, how much do you think that like, the inflexibility of hardware versus sort of like the flexibility of design, like how you look at that trade-off as yeah, kind yeah, of that, that's a very evolve. very good question actually. So basically, currently most ZK algorithms, either you are Plunk or even you are Grow sixteen or like you know any other algorithms, so they build on top of similar primitives. For example, they are like the mostly commonly adopted one are multi-scalar multiplication over elliptic curve and also FFTs over over large field. And I think those two are the most important primitives. If you get those components working really fast, then you can accelerate most ZK algorithms. But different algorithms differ a lot. Also, it depends on your circuit emulation you are using. Because for, currently for our ZK EVM, although we already have the, the kernels for uh, MSM and uh, FFT implemented, but the workflow needs to be trained a lot. For example, we, we need like 1,000 FFTs for our current ZK EVM. And the data copy between like the, the CPU and also like the FPJ, that becomes a new bottleneck. So um, I think if you're with your algorithm evolving, the basic primitive won't change, but it depends on your circuit shape, like, you know, how many custom cases you are using and it will influence the workflow and it will, it might influence your overall efficiency because some of other stuff can become the new bottleneck. And uh, they are also like, I think uh, th- those two primitives are commonly used in SNARK. In, in Fry, there might be some small differences because they can avoid some group operation. That's also a reason why SNARK is considered to be faster than SNARK because they are they don't need elliptic curve, they don't need any group operation, they only need FFT or a, a smaller field and hush. But you know, with the scalability increasing, it's also very hard to, to accelerate FFT 
for very large scale. So it's still like a, a huge trade off. But the parameters underlying don't change、mm. too much as far as your, your bit wise is fixed. And、uh, yeah. I will say one funny thing about Starkware, right? Is like the programming language still makes you have to think about field elements and like there's no strings and like dot, 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 right? Like there's actually like some funny things of like you went to all this trouble to avoid group operations, but then like you actually still force a developer who may not, you know, totally understand what that means to have to actually reason about. Some of those things more directly. And I think that's something that I think ZKVM hopefully avoids in the sense that, like, you know, hopefully no one has to actually like really understand KZG to write like Uniswap. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's our priority and to be the most developer friendly ZK r o p I have one more question about what you were just saying with like the hardware acceleration. If you have these kind of like you're talking about optimizations, but when you talk about optimizing, ZK in this context. And this is actually about like EVM speed and gas fees on the roll up. I'm just curious, like when you talk about optimizing the circuits, are you talking about making anything in the actual like use of the L2 faster? Or is it literally just in like how quickly one could prove, how cheaply one could prove, how small the proof is? Like, yeah, I'm just curious if it has any impact on the actual like running of the network. Yeah, I think that's a good question. So, Uh, basically, when I'm talking about hardware acceleration, so firstly, that if you don't have you know, good hardware support, you literally can't generate proof in time. For example, the given circuit might take you five hours to generate the proof. So that's the first thing, like, you know,、okay. it's important to make that practical. We already make that practical enough. And second, talking about the cost, I think still, like, you know, with, with ease price, still, like, you know, at a very high, I think the data availability cost is still. Larger than the proving cost. Like, you know, the cost when you are storing your, your raw transaction data on chain is still higher than the proving cost. So it's more about the energy consumption for generating the proof and whether you, you generate that in a more efficient way and with, with less cost. But for the fee perspective, it's not dominant by this, this proving cost. And、uh, it, it might change after, you know, there are a lot of dunk sharding and、uh, EIPs implemented on Ethereum. But currently, yeah. Hmm. I want to actually bring it sort of to a higher level, which is you had mentioned that like the ZK and ZK EVM is not about privacy. It's about almost like compressing or acting as the roll up. But do you have any ideas for types of projects that would do best on something like a ZK EVM versus something else? Either like the regular EVM base chain or like another EVM compatible other chain that's been bridged to Ethereum? Yeah, so first of all, all of the existing applications like,、uh, should be compatible with the ZK EVM. And then I think for those,、uh, if you consider like, comparing some alt、uh, layer one that's EVM compatible,、uh, so the bridge I think becomes kind of the, one of the loophole inside of your security guarantee that sometimes it can be easily attacked. But with the ZK EVM, so the bridge you can be guaranteed、uh, with the validity proof so that's.、Uh, A lot of things like more secure than some other, like the out layer ones. And then I think for those applications that have high stake and then require those security, and then also want to have、uh, high frequency, like the low gas fee, and then with very high frequent、uh, transactions and a lot of users,、uh, those applications will be very suitable for the ZK EVM.、Uh, I think another like, direction we are also like, actively, research team is actually looking into is that, you know. As I mentioned, we, we definitely want to add some features via the KVM. So, for example, we can enable some like, pre compiles or some, some new primitives, especially on our the KVM. As some, for example, we build some specialized circuit for some hash function so that you can do that kind of crypto optimization,、mm-hmm. especially on our the KVM in a cheap way. So, that's something like, you know, we can definitely enable. And also, as you mentioned, like, you care about privacy. So, But you know, from our perspective, Layer 2 is built for scalability, for reducing the, the, the congestion problem on, on Ethereum Layer 1. Because you can't get both, especially under the account based model, it's very hard for you to get privacy. Because it's, even for, for ALO, for some other companies, they are building under a UTXO model. So it's very hard to build privacy、mm-hmm. under the account based model. So I think privacy, like Aztec or some other techniques, maybe some other featured. Apps specialize maybe some smaller r o l l u p s and we can verify the proofs in our ZK EVM. And so they can you know, be some specialized、mm-hmm. you know, r o l l u p s instead of you know, a general purpose r o l l u p But by adding some more crypto primitive support in our ZK EVM, we can, 
we can support those proof verification more more cheaper and uh, yeah things like that. Do you ever imagine being used like where part of a DAP is on the main chain and the other part is on the zk evm something like i've heard sort of the example of like maybe the governance module is on the roll up and something that happens rarely could still be on mainnet but they're somehow connected do you imagine something like that i think for now like we haven't like thought into that direction it basically depends on like you know if you are doing something which is more computational heavy you can move that off chain and the user cheaper proof instead of the but the actual cost, if you are running, you know, ZKVM or ZKVM model, it might be like higher in verification cost. So it depends on like, you know, how costly your, your initial computation can be comparing with your, your proof verification. So it's a trade-off and yeah, it's, it's an interesting direction, but we haven't looked into that yet. Yeah. This actually, though, just brings up another question. So I've been doing a series on like bridges and interoperability zones and all that. And one of the things is this idea of like general message passing. So I always think of a roll up very focused on like, you know, it's data availability and then it moves tokens. But I don't know, actually, if like, do you have messages also going back and forth between the L2 and like the mainnet? Like, are you changing state? like of accounts, can you like basically send a message through your roll-up bridge? Yeah, I think that's a good question. I think you can still send a message like through some of the specialized contract and then that can be forwarded to the layer one. I think that's totally possible to well, do could that. Could it be executed there? Yeah, I think like uh, as long as you can provide actual uh, functionality in the bridge like to having not only sending some tokens as long as, uh, and also you can say like I want to invoke some of the smart contract there like on the layer one or like vice versa you can say like that on the layer one you can send some message or and token along with invoking certain contract on the layer two so you can mm. have this interoperability I think between the layer one and the layer two yeah that's just something I feel like at least I I haven't explored enough I mean I do think one thing that gets changed with message passing if you have an ability to standardize the messages into fixed size proofs is that people could generate the messages on say scroll for some computation they want to do and then send it elsewhere under like a fixed size packet right so like maybe you do the computation on scroll you do some weird flash loan you like have some kind of complicated thing you generate the proof and then you you relay the proof to all the other layer twos via some kind of generic message pressing layer that actually is sort of a more full model than say something like wormhole or layer zero or nomad right because they can't actually give you any guarantees on the calculation unlike a zk bridge right like they can only kind of give you very simple right now at least simple transactions and you do rely on kind of like the relayers economic incentives in that though there's a new agent or new like operator you just mentioned like that's a between l2 message passing system right not going through the l1 i think uh what you could do is you have the between l2 that falls back to l1 i guess that's like closest to nomad in design land right now okay um but it doesn't require like staking on all the chains, right? Like the problem with something a like wormhole is you effectively have to, your capital efficiency is kind of low. You have to stake on every chain and like the amount of stake at every place determines sort of the security. But I think the idea is if you have a ZK, a single ZK chain that does a computation and generates a proof, and then you only have to send that proof, the sort of economic value of that proof is a lot lower than like, hey, I have to move coins on the other place, right? Mm. So, so there'll be like a lot of weird like, capital efficiency trade-offs i think when you start thinking about like zk l2 stuff versus optimistic or versus like you know wormhole style things where it's like you have synthetic assets on mm -hmm. both sides because the synthetic asset is not free it does require like a bunch of capital to kind of be backing it implicitly not not that there's not a place for all of this right like the, they can get to production faster right but i think it will be interesting in the long run to see how zk's change how much capital you actually need to have on every chain. Like right now it's like quadratic yeah. in the number of chains, right? Like you basically need to have capital on every chain and then the minimum amount depends on every pair of chains. And in some ways, hopefully a ZK thing lets that be less more efficient for message passing. Sorry, that was just my rant, little rant about that. Sorry, that wasn't like any <laughs> anything that anyone is doing right now. I'm 
No, I think like, it's a very interesting like topic to discuss. I think in the future there will be, could be like some interoperability between the UN two ZK rollups, like two ZK layer twos. So I like, mm. can directly like the allocate the funds in different places and then execute it at a different place, I guess. So I guess one thing that I think is kind of cool about ZKPs is that you get almost like an interoperability standard built in, right? You only have to trust the verifiers written correctly, which is a lot lower of a workload than having to trust that the VM translation is written correctly, right? Like you can argue that like the optimism bug um, that was found by Sorek and then the wormhole bug both have this problem of like there's two VMs that don't exactly agree, right? They're not bitwise identical. Yeah, yeah. And the translation layer was where, like, the bug of the synthetic thing happened. But a ZK thing, as long as the verifier contract is correct, it's you have basically perfect interoperability. And so I think that's a just lower surface for bugs and errors. You know, I think once the ZK rollups are live, it'll be way easier to do this type of stuff because you'll have all these networks of provers who are already validating this chain, and you can basically be like, hey, can you, like, generate this proof that I can then relay somewhere else, and it doesn't matter who relays it. That's really interesting. I guess going back to scroll, though, do you have ideas of like, I mean, you're still building. We should find out actually where you're at in this build. But like, I mean, I think this kind of brings us to the question of like, at what stage is the project? What's your timeline for actually having, you know, us be able to play with a ZK VM? So we have like the design two phases of like for our test nets, and then we're quite close to have our uh, phase one test that, uh, which like we are almost like 70% down. And then right now we can already support some ERC20 transfer on the ZK EVM. Everything works very smoothly, like ex- expected. So we'll see like our first uh, launch of test net in uh, like a few months, one to two months. Uh, and then I think like then in the phase two, so in the phase one, we'll probably like to support some limited uh off codes and then some of the transactions. And then in the phase two will be like the full compatibility uh, ZK EVM testnet so that like every smart contract that supposed to be able to run on the Ethereum should be able to run on the scroll testnet. Cool. What applications, you know, obviously it's just like early in this space and, you know, who knows what the real application was. Like 2016 Ethereum, you couldn't have predicted most of the things that exist now. What are kind of the applications you're most excited about being enabled by Scroll that you know you've kind of heard of or thought through? I think uh, those like for example the consumer facing applications like the target for more uh, the, and then some social applications uh, close to like the more users like not only the DeFi application that's only targeted for some financial applications, uh, but more like the custom facing uh, application for example the Stefan or uh, those like social applications like the. There'll be like very interesting use cases and also to enlarge the whole uh, user space for the blockchain, like for the cryptocurrencies, to bring more new customers to the blockchain, like to the crypto world. Mm. Cool. Yeah, I, I think from my side, like, you know, because I'm a ZK guy, so I want to see more ZK applications. And uh, yeah, especially on, on our platform and they got like cheaper ref- proof verification, maybe we can support more more stuff to support those interesting ZK applications. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So I want to say thank you to both of you for coming on the show and sharing with us sort of the journey to scroll and your thoughts about ZK EVM, what that could enable, how it's built. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for hosting. Yeah, thank you, Anna and Tarun, for hosting us and having us to here. It's very pleasure to talk to you guys on the ZK podcast. Looking forward to the next one where we, we learn more about how, how Scroll Live is working. Yeah. So I want to say a big thank you to the podcast editor, Henrik, podcast producer, Tanya. Thanks to Chris for research and to our listeners. Thanks for listening. 